Hello everyone. Welcome to today's lesson. I'm Mr. Kevin Jaggi from the School of Computing and Informatics. Uh, the today's unit is Introduction to Computers and Programming. And by the end of this particular uh, lesson, you are going to understand what is a computer, what makes up a computer, the different components of a computer, uh, the advantages and disadvantages of a computer, the application areas where we apply the use of computers and the different classification of computers. So uh, we are going to start by understanding what is a computer. And a computer is an electronic device that takes input, that is in form of data, processes that input through the central processing unit based on the predefined instructions to produce information as output to the user or to be taken to the storage for future use. So that is what makes up a computer. A computer uh, is a system that is made up of those four major components. It's made up of the input devices that takes up the input from the user, which is in form of raw data or variables that are not processed, which are taken to the processor for processing. And this is where we have the central processing unit that processes this data into information, which is taken to the user in form of an output. And this output, which is in form of information, can be taken to the storage, to the storage units, or they can be displayed on the screen uh, to the user. And these four components are the key areas that makes up a computer. We have other electronic uh, components or electronic devices that do not qualify to be a computer, like the television, uh, the radio, the mobile phones, and other electronic components that exist because they do not perform these four major areas. You find like a television and, or the radio may perform one or two of these areas uh, as much as it is an electronic device, but a computer performs all these four areas. And therefore, this is what uh, qualifies or makes an electronic component to be a computer. And each of these uh, components has various devices that works alongside with it, like in the input device, there are quite a number of input devices that exist that the user can use to enter uh, data into the keyboard, uh, the mouse, uh, the microphone, all those are input devices that the user can use to accept data into the, to the computer. The processing is done through the processor. And then on the output, again, we have quite a number of output devices. Depending on what uh, the user enters in here, if you enter sound, then the output will be in form of a speaker, which will produce that particular uh, sound. If it is a uh, digital data, the screen will be an output device for that uh, particular uh, matter. And the output, again, can be in form of a printer if it's a hard copy. And the data can be stored into the internal storage of the computer or external storage, where we have the external storage devices. So that's what makes up a computer. Again, a computer is a system, meaning that it is made up of several uh, components that work together as one, they work together as a unit. So we have the hardware components, the software components, and then the, the user, or the, the, the people who are using the computer. The hardware components are the tangible parts of the computer, the physical parts of the computer, which includes uh, the keyboard, the mouse, the screen, or the monitor, the hard disk, the processor, uh, the motherboard, all the physical parts of the computer, there are quite a number of them, they are categorized as hardware components, which cannot work on their own. They require programs or softwares to control them. And softwares are a set of instructions that control what the hardware components uh, does. And this is done through the user. The user uh, is the one who feeds the commands that get through the software. Uh, to control what the hardware does. So we have the users of the computer or the, the person controlling the computer. For instance, the user may want to save a document. To save a document, 
uh, that command, save command, is activated by the user who clicks on a particular point of the screen or a particular point of the application program, let's say you're using Microsoft Word, which will prompt that command to save or to move that file to the storage unit. Maybe you're saving it on a flash disk or a hard disk or any part of the computer. And, and therefore, the user drives that command that, uh, that the, the hardware acts on. And these three works as a unit. Therefore, the hardware cannot work on, it on their own. The hardware and the software cannot work on their own. They require the user to control and drive them. Therefore, the computer is referred to as a computer uh, system. Then this particular computer has a number of characteristics that makes it suitable, especially in the application areas that we use computers. Because before computers came about, they are, uh, the same tasks they are performing were done by human beings. And what makes the computer better in particular specific areas is because of some of their characteristics. For instance, when it comes to uh, speed, they can perform complex calculations and computations within a matter of second. What a human being would take more time, like when you're multiplying a million times a million times a million, the computer would do that within a microsecond, but a human being might take a minute or two to do the same. Therefore, they can be able to perform a lot of tasks and complex computations within a matter of uh, microsecond. They are accurate based on the kind of instructions that you give them. If you give them the correct instruction, they'll produce correct results. If you give them the wrong instructions, they'll give you the wrong result because uh, the computer does not have the intelligence of their own. They de depend on the kind of command the user enters in. They can store large amount of data within a small space. If you have a hard disk of one gigabit or uh, one terabyte, that can store large volumes of data which would occupy a lot of space if the same data was to be put in files in cabinets and put somewhere in an office. The entire office would be occupied with files. Compared to that, uh, a, a single disk can store large volumes of data and therefore it makes them uh, much better in terms of storage. Then they can work for many hours without getting tired, without complaining, without uh, making an error due to uh, fatigue and so on. Therefore, uh, diligence is also another characteristic of computers. We also have facility where a computer can perform completely different tasks without uh, complaining or without getting tired again. At the same time, in simple terms, they can be able to multitask. They can do more than one task at the same time, especially with the modern kind of softwares, the operating systems that support that. A computer, you can be using a computer, you're typing a document at the same time, you're downloading a file from the internet, at the same time you're playing music from uh, using the same computer, at the same time you are printing a document using the same computer. So they are able to perform quite a number of tasks at the same time due to the nature of the multitasking uh, aspect of the computer. They also have a power of remembering. A computer can be able to remember quite a lot, especially the task that was done earlier on compared to human being who may not be able to do that with accuracy. You can restore back to the computer to an earlier date or you can uh, refer back to a task that was done even five years ago with accuracy and within a short time. So they have a power of remembering. Computers do not have intelligence of their own. Therefore, they have no IQ uh, or intelligent quotient. This is uh, another characteristic of computers. Therefore, whatever you feed them is what you get out. Garbage in, garbage out. Meaning that they rely on the user's uh, instructions uh, to produce an output. And the accuracy and the correctness of the output depends on the, what the user gets into the computer. They have no feeling, meaning that they do not have uh, emotions. Therefore, whatever you instruct them, they will do that particular task without uh, getting tired, like the way the human being can work for a long number of hours. They, 
they, they, they, they get tired, and at the same time, they may not perform well, especially if they don't have experience. Computers will do each and every task given to them, uh, especially uh, if you enter the correct command. And therefore, they, they, do not have, uh, they, they do not have intelligence of their own. At the same time, they can work for quite a number of hours, especially within a short period of time. The next session is on the application areas. We have quite a number of application areas where we can use uh, the computers. Basically, all areas of our day-to-day -day life, you can use them in business, you can use them in education, you can use them in marketing, in banking, all the tasks that requires the application of uh, computers, then they are, they are the most appropriate. In business, you can use them for online shopping, you can use them for uh, marketing products. In education, you can use them for accessing uh, online education or materials, researching materials. You can use them for taking up a course, especially through distance learning and so on. On the marketing aspect, you can use them uh, for marketing products through the social media platforms. You can use them uh, to market product through uh, digital marketing uh, aspect. You can do banking uh, through the computers, especially through uh, online, online banking. And quite a number of areas, especially in our day-to-day -day life. We also have insurance uh, aspect. We also have uh, the communication application area, the healthcare, the military and the engineering design, where each one of these uh, sections uh, touches our day-to-day -day, uh, aspect of human life. In communication, mostly we use them, especially when sending an email, we use a computer. When uh, you are chatting through the social uh, networks, you, can, you also use the computer. The patient data can also be stored uh, using the computer, and the same can be tabulated and manipulated through the use of computers in manufacture of uh, weapons, mostly in the military aspect, we use them uh, for that particular aspect. So almost each and every area of a human life uses computers directly. And these computers have quite a number of advantages and disadvantages. And the main one is the use of the ability to perform multiple a task at the same time they are multitasking they can do one or more tasks at the same time and like the human being they can perform that with the speed and again they are they are cost efficient in terms of cost and the storage of huge amount of data that would require to be stored on large spaces they, uh, they are best at that they are accurate in terms of the output also. They also have a disadvantage in that uh, they cause unemployment because some of the tasks that a human being would do uh, individually or people would be employed to perform certain tasks, then the same can be done by computers. Maybe tasks that was done by two or three people can be done by a single user using a single computer and therefore they cause unemployment. Again, sometimes uh, because they are addictive, they, they cause a lot of wastage of time and, uh, and energy, especially when uh, users become addicted to social media networks uh, or in gaming, then they spend a lot of time on games and social media and therefore uh, uh, head up wasting a lot of time. They cause data security uh, especially sometimes when you have hackers getting into uh, personal information, it, one can lose the information as a result of uh, the aspect of data security. Computers uh, have also been used to perpetrate uh, computer crimes or resort to crime where people or the people can steal data from other users such that uh, Information that is meant to be private is uh, available or availed to the unauthorized users and therefore resorting to privacy 
a violation of people's data. At the same time, they also have an impact on the environment where computer parts that are disposed of can cause a health hazard to the users if they are not well dis disposed. These computers were designed over a period of time. And here we are going to look at uh, the historical development of these computers. What were the key electronic elements that were discovered at a particular point of time? that up to currently what we have as a computer. Computer did not start as a full complete computer like we have today. They started somewhere. Uh, and at each and every time in period, key electronic components were discovered. And with continuous research, uh, this has resulted to what we have currently as the modern computer. So the first computing device was referred to as Abacus, which was, uh, which was produced many years before uh, BC, that is before Christ, and this is dated at around 3000 BC, this computing device. It was a, a traditional calculating machine or aid that was used by business uh, people of this particular time, 3000 BC just to keep up with transactions, addition and subtraction, especially with business people. This is the beginning point of the current computer that we have. It is started at this point, and after this particular device, other key elements or devices were produced by mathematicians and philosophers of this partic each particular period that contributed to what we have currently. And after these abacus, then in 1614, a logarithm was uh, invented by a Scottish mathematician referred to as John Napier. And this was also another mathematical element or mathematical calculation device that was also used especially in calculation. And later, uh, William Ortred, an uh, Englishman, also invented a slide rule. And slide rule and the uh, logarithm, they are also part of what we have currently as computers because basically computers were designed as a result of the mathematical aspect, the calculation. That's why they are able to manipulate data in a mathematical model. They are based on zeros and ones, the binary digits. And therefore, if you look at the trend, basically majority of the inventors of the key element were mathematicians and philosophers of particular period of time. Blaise Pascal in 1642 uh, also invented a numerical wheel calculator. Again, this one was to help in the calculation. And after this particular time, then another uh, mathematician and a philosopher came up, improved the, the Pascal line and created a machine that could also multiply. The other one was for addition and subtraction. Uh, Gottfried Wilhelm also came up with a device that could also multiply. And then later, uh, Jacquard came up with the Jacquard room. This one was also another key invention in the design of computers because this device was storing instruction in a punched card. Uh, this, was, this was an input device that was storing instructions uh, for, to help the people who are carrying out this kind of business weaving of this particular period of time to store instructions. And then later in 1820, uh, Charles Xavier also came up with a machine that could perform the four basic mathematical functions, meaning that it could add, subtract, multiply, and divide. Again, this was also another calculation uh, device. Then later in 1822, Charles Babbage, who is a professor of mathemat mathematics, also uh, came up with a steam-powered engine, and later analytical engine, improved it into analytical engine. And this is the person who came up with um, a device that is close to what we have today as a computer. Because this device that was produced by Charles Babbage had the four key elements of a computer. The, it could take an input, it could process, it could uh, store, and it could also, uh, sorry, it could uh, process, it could also produce an output, and it could also store. So input, processing, output, and storage are the key areas of a computer 
which were invented by uh, Charles Babbage. And he's, he's regarded as the father of computers because what he produced is, uh, is what the current uh, manufacturers of computers are built on due to the fact that it could perform the key areas. And the same machine that he produced could also be driven through the use of uh, programs. The other came up with programs that could uh, manipulate that machine, and therefore he is regarded as the father of computers. And what came after it is just improvement of that, especially by George Bull, uh, who came up with the Boolean uh, algebra. And this uh, aspect of the Boolean algebra is used even to, in today's computer uh, logic gates, uh, which are used as logical elements, and they are implemented in modern computers. In this particular time, 1980s, a tabulator machine was also discovered by Herman Holly, who used a, a, a card, in this case, fudged card to store information. And these were used as input devices that were uh, discovered by Herman. And then von Neumann designed a um, discrete variable automatic computer that was around 1945. And later, in 1951, a universal automatic computer was built by Remington Rudd. And these, again, were built on the previous uh, discoveries, especially from uh, Charles Babbage. And what resulted was a much, much better device. Later, in 18, uh, 1958, Jack Kilby came up with the uh, integrated circuits. And therefore, what resulted is a more integration of components resulting into a smaller device uh, which was now the computer size be became smaller and so smaller as the key electronic elements came about. Remember, initially we started with vacuum tubes, then later went to integrated circuits or IC, resulting into a much smaller computer. And with the time until now, uh, the ability to squeeze more components into a small circuit board, a small silicon board, uh, is the process that is taking place. And after integrated circuits, we went to large scale integration, resulting into a sm smaller computer, and very large scale integration. And by the time we got, uh, by 1981, IBM introduced the, fi the first personal computer that could be used in homes, office, and in schools. So these computers started somewhere a long time ago with key discoveries of individual components. And with the time improvement of each and every component resulted to what we have today as a personal computer or a PC, uh, which can be used by individuals, either at homes, in offices, in schools, and so on. And as time goes on, even currently, computers are becoming smaller in size due to that ability to integrate more components into a small circuit board, referred to as integrated circuit. Uh, the power of computer in terms of speed is also increasing as uh, the days goes on and key discoveries are being done. Uh, the processing speed of computers is improving and increasing. And then their prices are also reducing due to new and better uh, discoveries and improvement. And as more users even acquire those computers, then their prices are going down. And with that, then, more people are acquiring those computers. And by 1990s, that is when, due to massive acquisition of computers, that is when uh, the need to connect them together so that different users can share resources came about. And that was the, techno the networking technology came about. And through that interconnection of computers together, has led to what we refer to as the global village because you can com communicate with different users within the, the, the entire group, uh, like you are within a small village. Today you can send an email and the recipient might be miles and miles away from where you are. So you communicate like you are within a small area due to the fact of that the, these computers can be integrated together, connected together, such that you can communicate in a network. So that is the historical development of computers, and which has led to what we have today. All those computers can be classified 
uh, based on a number of categories. You can classify them by the type of data they manipulate. There are those computers uh, that manipulate digital data and therefore they are digital computers. There are those manipulate uh, analog data and we also have a hybrid, a mix of both digital and analog. Digital computers, they manipulate data in form of zeros and ones, the binary data. And the, this data is discrete uh, variable, non-continuous. And these are the most common computers that we have in the group, within the group. They are digital computers. But there are those that measure variables that is in continuous form like um, the ones that measures uh, variables like pressure, things that are in continuous form. That category of computer is referred to as the analog computer. And there are those that measure both uh, digital and analog. They can measure discrete variables, numbers, and at the same time, uh, they can measure uh, non uh, continuous variables. They are referred to as hybrid computers like the ones computers we find in a, an area like in a petrol station where that computer is measuring the pressure of the fuel from the fuel tank at the same time it is calculating the prices of that fuel that is getting into uh, getting out of the tank in form of value variables digits numbers the price so you, you find that it is measuring two variables at the same time, and therefore it's a hybrid computer, given that it is dealing with both digital variables and analog uh, values. We also have a classification uh, based on the purpose of those computers. We have special purpose computers and uh, general purpose computers. Special purpose or dedicated computers, they are computers that are designed for a particular purpose. They are designed to perform a specific purpose. Let's say we have a, a computer that is designed for generation of ammunition in a manufacturing farm. They cannot be used in an office for general use, maybe typing and printing and uh, doing other things. They are generally uh, designed to work in a manufacturing farm. There are those that are designed to work in an hospital to, me, uh, to monitor uh, the progress of a patient, either measure the blood pressure, the sugar levels, and so on. Those are special purpose computers. And then we also have general purpose. You can use them for any uh, task, so long as you configure them to that particular task by installing the relevant software. If you want to type, you, know, you configure the computer to use a, um, an application like Microsoft One. You can use the same computer to carry out computation, mathematical computation, by using the appropriate application program like Spreadsheet. You can use the same uh, to manage the database record by using a database application. You can use the same computer to make a presentation by using presentation softwares like PowerPoint. So you can use them for general purpose. It depends on what you want to do. If you want to draw, you do use a drawing software. If you want to do a graphic design and manipulation, you use um, graphic softwares. So they are general purpose. It depends on what the user wants to perform using those computers. So they are also classified according to purpose. Then you can also classify them according to the size, price, and capability. This is one classification where under this classification, we have supercomputers, mainframe computers, uh, mini computers and the micro computers. Uh, the order here is in the form of the size. Supercomputers are the largest. Most of these are not used by individuals. They are used to manage lecons, especially uh, where large, uh, huge computation is required, especially in uh, government uh, sections where we have huge volumes of data is required, or like especially in parastatos or in areas where huge computation is involved. These super and mainframe, they are not used as individual computers. They are main. Maybe you may look at an area like in the registrar of persons. You expect a lot of data in such, such, such a section where you have each and every person within a country. Their data is contained in those computers. So you would, the government would use such kind of computers 
uh, especially where large volumes of data is involved. Mainframe computers are smaller than supercomputers, but again, uh, they work also in areas where large competition is involved, but not uh, as much as in supercomputer. So you'll find them, again, in areas like in companies, uh, medium-sized companies, uh, in hospitals, all in sections where a large volume of data is also involved, but not as much as in supercomputers. So they are smaller than supercomputers. And then mini computers, they are again smaller than super and mainframe computers. They are mostly used as servers also. They are not used as individual computers uh, because again, they are huge. They process a lot of data. And then we have microcomputer. They are the smallest. Micro means small. Therefore, these ones are used as individual computers or as personal computers. They can be used by individuals. And they also vary in size based on the type. We have the notebook. There are small computers which can act as a, a notebook where you can put a small points as, as like a notebook. We have a desktop computer. This is a computer that you can use while placed on a desktop, as the name indicates. A, a laptop, you can place it on your laps. And a palm top, you can place it on your palm. That is the, the top of your head, the palm. And therefore, this varies again in terms of the size and the usage. Desktop, the uh, personal computers that you can use as a, on a fixed location, uh, where maybe in an office, in a school. A laptop, it's a portable device. You can move alongside with it and work it anywhere. You can place it on a desk. You can sit down and place it on your lap and uh, use it comfortably. Uh, the palm top, the same. It's a small computer that can place it on top of your palm and use it just like a normal computer. So that's the classification according to the size, the price, and capability. And lastly, you can classify them according to generation, where you have first generation, second generation, third generation, fourth, and the fifth. So each of these uh, Classification is based on what we have grouped at the, uh, within the historical development of computers. Between 1946 and 59, uh, these are classified as uh, first generation computers, or basically 1940s. These computers are, forms a generation based on the key element that formed these computers of this time. The first generation computers, the key element was the vacuum tubes. The second generation, the key element was, was the, uh, sorry, uh, uh, the first generation, the key element was the vacuum uh, tubes. And these are the computers of 19, uh, 1940s. Then the second generation, the key element was uh, the tra transistors. And therefore, each of these components forms a particular design and a particular characteristic that result from this particular computer. Like the ones that form were based on vacuum tubes, they are quite big in size. They generated a lot of heat, and therefore uh, they, re they required space. They, uh, a single computer could occupy an entire room. They generated a lot of heat. They were very slow, and uh, the input was in form of punch card. And therefore, these particular uh, computers uh, were based in this particular uh, period of time. But later, the vacuum tubes were replaced with the use of uh, transistors, and they formed what we call the second generation from 1959 to 65. So the vacuum tubes were replaced with transistors, and what resulted, again, was uh, a computer with certain characteristics. They were smaller than the first generation. They were faster than the previous generation. They generated less, less heat, and then they could be able to perform more in terms of uh, functionality uh, than the previous generation. The input, again, was also in form of punch card, or magnetic tapes and magnetic disks that were used to store data. But later in the third generation, integrated circuits replaced now these transistors and again resulted into another generation, which is referred to as the third generation. So integrated circuit, or IC, uh, replaced the transistors. And again, the computer that came out after that was a much better than the, the first two generations. Uh, it was a much smaller computer, 
that was a bit faster that could store data in a much better way and generated less heat. And after this uh, integrated circuit, the fourth generation resulted into much integration of this component, which resulted into large-scale integration. The fourth generation was based on large-scale integration or very large-scale integration that was based on microprocessors. And this resulted again into a computer that could perform much better than the first three generations. It was small in size, and uh, the speed of those computers was quite higher. Uh, they used a graphical user interface where the users could easily work with them. They were more user friendly, and they were using a programming language, and therefore users could even develop applications based on these uh, generational computers. And the, the last generation is based on is based on the fifth generation. The fifth generation is from 1980s up to current, or up to today. So this is based on ultra-large scale integration. Ultra-large scale integration, we started with uh, integrated circuits, let's say uh, uh, hundreds of components integrated together. Then very large integration of components, that is thousands of components together. And here you're talking millions or billions of components integrated together into one single component. And what is happening again, the computer is becoming smaller and smaller in size. And the performance is becoming much, much better. So this fifth generation, what uh, the key aspect of the fifth generation is to have a computer that is using the artificial intelligence or the use of um, a programming language that makes the computer to behave like a human being. In other words, uh, this particular generation, which is still under development, it is not complete because this is the current generation that we are in. When this generation is complete, we are expecting a computer that would behave like a human being. In other words, in terms of uh, the, the, the operation. The current computers that we are using nowadays, you enter the command by typing, where the characters appear on the screen as you type. So they take input through the user command. But in this case, how does, when you say they'll behave like a human being? Human being, they instruct through the voice command. You tell a human being, move from this point to this point, voice command. And therefore, this uh, fifth generation will be taking voice command. So instead of typing, you'll be talking to a computer, or you talk through the microphone, as the characters appear here on the screen. So they are based on artificial intelligence, or this generation will be based on uh, artificial intelligence, which is going to assist in making even the functional uh, aspect of this computer to be much, much better. These are still, still in development. We have some devices that have already been uh, produced, like in mobile phones, which are still taking voice command, like you're using a mobile phone, uh, you have some contacts that have been saved in that uh, mobile phone, and uh, maybe you want to call uh, or to dial a particular number by the name you have saved. This is somebody by the name Peter. Instead of scrolling down manually, you can just talk to your phone, say Peter, and the the uh, the contact Peter appears on the on the uh, on the front screen, and you dial it directly. Therefore, this particular a generation is still under development. So that uh, brings us to the end of our today's uh, lesson. Thank you. These televised lectures supplement our robust online learning going on on our MKU online platform. You can view more on our televised lectures via our online platform. We are in a digital era and Mount Kenya University knows this. The following are the steps to follow so as to complete your online application. Download the application form from the website www.mku.ac.ke. Attach copies of your academic certificates and ID. Pay the application fees via M-Pesa pay bill number 270988. Your ID is the account number. 2,000 shillings is the charge for a postgraduate. You can also deposit in the bank accounts provided on the website.
Then email all the above to apply at mku.ac.ke.